Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you stay ahead of the challenges impacting healthcare finance. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanate. Hi, this is Mike Passanate, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. How hospitals adjust prices with private insurers following reductions in public funding is an issue that has long been debated. To shed some light on that debate, I'm joined today by Michael Darden, who is an associate professor at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University, and Ian McCarthy, who is an assistant professor of economics at Emory University. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Hi. Thanks. So, Michael and Ian, you are co-authors on a working paper published by the National Bureau of Economic Research that examined how hospitals adjust prices with private insurers following reductions in public funding. Why don't you start off by telling us why you chose to take a closer look at this particular issue? Yeah, so I was um – this is Michael, by the way. So I I was – about a year ago, I was thinking about the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program uh, in a different context. Uh, with respect to local area characteristics and how the risk adjustment uh, in that program actually works, thinking about disparities, uh, especially with respect to access. And uh, learning a little bit more about the program, I started to think about, you know, what were some of the unintended consequences of um, pay-for-performance schemes in the ACA, but more generally. Um, And I, at the time, I was actually unaware of the cost-shifting literature, the cost-shifting literature being that in which public reimbursements are reduced and private payments uh, might might be different as a result. And so I started thinking about that, and uh, I realized that this was a, a kind of a historic literature, one that's been going on for a really long time, um, and uh, one that's quite contentious, actually. Um, and so just started thinking more about the, the question that way. Um, uh, so that's how I, I got into it. And this this debate is um, important from a policy perspective, as you mentioned. It's it's been it's it's not uh, we're not in universal agreement as to uh, across economists um, as to how hospitals respond to these public uh, payment reductions. But getting the right answer to that is really important for making right policy prescriptions because they have completely different predictions. So on one end. Um, if hospitals are not cost shifting, then a reduction in public payments will tend to theoretically at least lower or at least not increase private insurance payments. And so in that sense, if we want to control costs a little bit, um, reducing, say, Medicare payments um, is kind of a good thing. Um, there could be other other consequences, but in terms of of public of uh, private prices, reducing these public payments um, has kind of a positive effect on um, on private insurance spending as well. Um, but if if we think hospitals are cost shifting, then we're on a complete other end of the policy uh, prediction, where a reduction in public payments actually raises private insurance prices, and so this. This issue of cost shifting and identifying whether it happens or how much it happens um, can generate two completely different policy predictions, and so getting a hold on this debate is really, um, we think, an important an important thing, and we think something that we're able to do in this paper um, based off of the, um, the, the payment reductions that were instituted as part of a handful of provisions in the Affordable Care Act. And, and and just to add to that, one, I mean, one of the things that I found fascinating about this literature uh, when, I, when I started getting into it was that, you know, you, you have a situation in which private payments uh, from insurance companies to hospitals are negotiated by private insurance companies and hospitals. And yet, and so, you know, so typically when we think of a bargaining process, we think about two sides that are opposing each other in some way. Um, but cost shifting is something that both sides of the negotiation claim is going on. Private insurance companies obviously want to be paying lower prices to hospitals, and so they don't want cost shifting to be going on. Uh, and they think that I mean, there's this long literature of, of, of private insurance companies uh, complaining that, you know, for example, Medicare is not paying their share. 
Um, and then hospitals claim that hospital that uh, cost shifting is going on because clearly they want the government to increase public reimbursements, not decrease them. Uh, and they claim, well, this is the only way that we can survive by passing these costs off to private insurance companies. So, I, I mean, I thought that was really interesting um, that, that you know, both sides are claiming that this is going on. And, and we wanted to study it empirically. Yeah, it's, it's really a fascinating topic, and I'd like to dive into your analysis. Could you briefly talk about the data set that you chose to uh, look at and, and the factors uh, in particular that you studied? Yeah, so we, um, we're we essentially using two kind of central data sets here. There are a handful of things that we that we incorporate, but the first data set is, is um, data from the Healthcare Cost Institute, and our co-author Eric uh, Barrett is, is there. And this gets us a unique um, opportunity to look at actual negotiated payments between hospitals and private insurers. Not all insurers, but this is a data set where a handful of insurers have contributed data um, to this, this kind of data warehouse, and the Healthcare Cost Institute um, manages those data. And um, it's, it's um, one of the few places where you can actually see Negotiated payments, right? So, so much of the of the price data when people talk about price in healthcare is often um, a hospital charge or some approximation based on a hospital charge. Um, so, we're able to actually see that negotiated price. Um, so, that's one central data set we're using. Another is um, we we can see data. Every hospital that takes Medicare patients has to submit um, essentially some sort of cost report to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services every year. And those are called the healthcare cost report information system, or they're they're held in that system. And so we use data from those reports to get a handful of hospital characteristics, but but essentially we use those to identify how much a hospital reported being penalized or rewarded under some of these new um, provisions in the ACA. So the the provisions in in particular are the hospital readmission reduction program and the hospital value-based purchasing program. So these are just two things that are essentially intended to pay a hospital based somewhat on quality um, or punish a hospital based somewhat on, on, on a, an assessment of, of low quality in some way. And so in those cost reports, a hospital actually reports how much money they received in terms of a bonus from, from any of those programs or a, a net penalty. And so we calculate that, and, and that is our main kind of variable that we're, that we're using to identify whether hospitals change a uh, change their private prices. So if they incur this penalty, um, do they then try to negotiate a higher price because their the, effectively their public payment um, public payment from Medicare has been reduced? And, and to add to that, um, I think you know it's important to recognize that the the payment data that we have is actually really important in answering this question. Um, so as Ian mentioned, you know in, historically people have used uh, what we think are inferior measures of actual prices. So the way it works is that a hospital has a uh, what they call a charge master, and the charge master is essentially a set of list prices for services. Um, and what the insurance company actually pays for a given service is negotiated, and there are usually considerable discounts on that charge. Um, so if you use charges as your measure of prices, um, you're not actually really studying what, pay, uh, what what is actually paid by the insurance company. And in our work, we've been able to show that the correlation between charges and payments is actually only about 0.4. So it's positively correlated, but they're not the same thing. And the literature going back a long time has found kind of mixed evidence of cost shifting. And, and, and anytime you have a situation in which you've got measurement error or you're using charges, for example, um, You'd be concerned of, of biasing results essentially towards zero, or not finding, any, or finding various different types of effects, right, uh, all over the map. So um, in our case, we think we've got a, a cleaner measure of what's actually being paid, um, and and we think that's a contribution. <laughs> 
That's a great setup. So let's talk about your major findings. And, and you did note, um, perhaps not unexpectedly, that, that hospitals that faced net payment reductions from the HRRP or the HVBP did appear to shift some of the cost to private payers. Uh, tell us what you found. So we're finding that on average, when a, when a hospital faces a net uh, reimbursement reduction from uh, from Medicare, uh, that private payments increased by about 1.5 percent, um, which is uh, which it, which is significant. Uh, it's it's roughly 150 dollars per claim. Um, and we're finding that uh, kind of across across the board on average uh, for uh, hospitals, um, we find that that effect is uh, the same essentially, as statistically at least, for nonprofits and for profits, which is somewhat surprising. Um, but it may be because we simply don't observe many for-profit hospitals anymore. Um, and we find that that effect is largely due to increases in circulatory system and nervous system uh, services. Um, and we're studying, we should, should note that we're studying just acute care admissions in this, in this study. And were there situations where cost shifting was more prevalent? Um, I think we found there were a couple. Yeah, 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 uh, okay. yeah there were a couple with that kind of um, settings where we were able to identify some what seemed to be slightly higher um, rates of increases on the private side. Um, the, the, most, the clearest one was among hospitals that had a larger share of private insurance patients. Um, so in some previous literature, the, the idea of that is if I'm a hospital that has lots of private insurance patients, then I might um, have slightly more power in a negotiation with a private insurer because I am such a large source of care for that, that insurer's patients. So if we think of that, that, um, that looking at private insurance share is kind of capturing that type of bargaining power, then we do actually see higher um, rates of private insurance uh, payment increases among those people with, with larger, those hospitals with larger shares of private um, insurance patients. What's, what's interesting about that too is that you know you could think of it going the other way. In fact, it's kind of I think my initial intuition about that was that it would go the other way in the sense that you might imagine that a hospital that has a large share of public patients would obviously be affected by a net penalty or a reimbursement reduction from the from Medicare more, uh, and would have a greater incentive to pass costs off to private insurance companies. Um, and it, our finding is that uh, we find the opposite, like Ian said. Um, it's consistent with another paper that looked at that uh, particular issue with respect to the balanced budget amendment um, um, from 1997. Um, but I think it does say something about uh, hospital bargaining power and how close these negotiations, negotiations are. When, when, when a hospital has a large share of private patients, they're a bigger player at the, negotiation, the negotiating table with uh, private insurance firms. Um, and, and we're seeing that in the, in the cost shifting um, data that, or the evidence that we found. So, uh you know, overall, what do you think this research tells us and what are some potential next steps? I think at, at a minimum, this tells us, even if you're highly skeptical of, so I'll step back briefly. The, the, the skepticism of cost shifting is mainly among economists because there is, it's theoretically difficult to imagine hospitals raising the price if they could have already raised the price before. Right? And that's essentially what cost shifting says, is suddenly something happens on, a private, on the public insurance side, and now I'm gonna raise my price on the private insurance side. And the natural question is, well, if you could have raised your price, why didn't you do it last year or the year before that? So I think all of our next steps are kind of geared around trying to identify what is really happening that would drive this increase in price. Um, you know, what is it that a hospital is doing to, to, to be able to negotiate that higher price. Um, 
And, I, but I think right now what we do feel confident in saying is that there there appears to be some amount of cost shifting, and this isn't an effect that appears to be that that looks to be driven by say a quality improvement or um, the other arguments that, that that we've heard that that, that try to explain um, you know how a hospital might be able to translate these things into a price increase. Um, we really do all of the evidence that really is pointing toward this idea that there's a public payment reduction, and this somehow spurs a negotiation that wherein the hospital can raise their price on private insurance without having done anything that we've identified so far to change their product, right? They're not somehow um, providing more imaging or having people stay in the hospital longer or doing more intensive services. We're not finding any of that. It's, it's to some extent, purely a transfer reduction in, in payments on one end, higher price on the other, and no, no other, um, no other change in the product. But that's that. Those are the next steps: is, is trying to really be be more confident in the claim that nothing else is changing about the underlying product that the hospital is offering. And and that's that's you know to to just expand on that. I mean that that's an important point um, that uh, that some people have raised about our, our study is that. Um, you know, other things might so a hospital so the hospital readmissions reduction program creates incentives for hospitals to improve their quality, to improve their rate of readmissions, to to have fewer readmissions. So so you know naturally economists and others would think um, you know we would see you know that these incentives are real. We would we would see improvements in quality. That literature is kind of kind of uh, kind of mixed at the moment. Um, there have been the evidence of. Uh, um, readmissions reductions, but there's also been evidence of mortality increases as a result. Uh, in our data, as Ian said, we, we don't find evidence uh, of a direct link between uh, quality changes and these reimbursement reductions. Um, but you know, even if even if we did, you know, we wouldn't call it cost shifting in that case because the underlying product has changed. But uh, you know, there, there's still a message here that that. Prices have gone up, and, and we see that robustly in our data. Um, and 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 so I, you know I, I think we we have I mean this is a, kind of a policy relevant kind of finding in that we want to think about what pay for performance schemes really really do downstream for the rest of the the, the system. Yeah, and, and thinking more broadly about these pay for performance. Models, or, or um, especially the hospital readmission reduction program and hospital value-based purchasing, there are some. Um, you can imagine, you can tell a, a pretty easy story that would um, suggest that these these instruments have been relatively blunt in terms of their effect on hospitals. So, for example, in the readmission reduction program, I think as of fiscal year 2017, in that year, if effectively 80% of hospitals are penalized under this program. And the reason they're penalized is because you're assessed based separately based on lots of different conditions. And if any of these conditions you fall below a national average as a hospital, you, you're subjected to a penalty. And so what ends up happening is that a lot of hospitals are above average in some, but below average in other conditions. And the program keeps adding more and more conditions. So what's effectively happening is that more and more hospitals are being subjected to a penalty. So the, we're we're sympathetic to the idea and are taking very seriously the idea that quality might go up from these readmission reduction program, for example. But we have to remember it's not just quality, say, on Medicare. It's not just reducing Medicare um, readmissions. It all, it's also you, that you have to reduce private insurance readmissions for that to explain what we're seeing in our data. And it also um, uh, needs Another thing going in our favor here in terms of interpreting this as cost shifting versus something else is that the program just penalizes everyone. And it's easy to imagine a hospital talking with an insurer essentially um, in a setting where we're all penalized. So this is effectively an across-the-board reduction in, in public payments, um, not necessarily something that's discriminating between um, you know, hospitals of, of slightly lower quality or, or higher quality.
Yeah, I mean, we imagine a situation in which hospitals go to the bargaining table and say, "Look, we, you know, we're, we're under uh, an increasingly um, tight Medicare situation as a result of of these policies," and um, you know, th- this is hypothetical because it's kind of a black box as to the negotiating process. But we could imagine a situation in which a hospital claims to an insurance company, "Look, we're being we're being docked on on services X and Y, and so if you could increase our payments for Z, that would really help us out." Um, and uh, again, we you know we can't identify specific mechanisms like that. Uh, we are, but we do identify a a significant increase on average. Um, uh, that uh, looks to be attributed to these policies. Michael Nian, this has been a very interesting contribution to the overall discussion. If our listeners would like to get a copy of the working paper, where can they go? Uh, they can go to the National Bureau of Economic Research website, um, uh, which uh, has a, a link for working papers. Well, that's great, and we'll, we'll certainly include yeah. a link to it. Uh, from the uh, the show notes of this podcast. And uh, again, Michael and Ian, thank you very much for joining us today and spending some time on the Hospital Finance Podcast. Yeah, thank you, Mike. That's great. Thank you, Mike. If you have a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the Hospital Finance Podcast, or if you'd like to be a guest, drop us a line at update at Bessler.com. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler. Smart about revenue, tenacious about results.